your first session this afternoon. So with that, All right, thank you. I hope you can hear me in the back, right? Okay, good. So, um, my name is Milan Jankov. I work for LifeRay. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the company, but we've uh, been around for quite a long time doing portals. Now we do uh, a lot of OSGI stuff. And I'm a developer advocate, which means I'm, I'm one of those people that tend to go out and talk to actually the real developers and trying to figure out what they're actually doing and why they're doing it this way and try to help them actually solve problems. So if you're familiar with LifeRay, you may recognize LifeRay as the portal company, which is what it used to be. And we used to do a lot of portal stuff uh, in the past, but we kind of shifted into doing a lot more things recent, in the recent years. Um, and uh, what you see here is some of the projects that we uh, work on. And you can probably recognize there's been a lot of effort going on into the front-end developer, helping front-end developers being more productive. It's not so much about j enterprise Java developers, even though we modularize the whole platform and it's not much better. In terms of, m we, we made business lives easier, but in terms of making developers' lives easier, it's not it goes with that much of an achievement. Uh, so there are things that we could have done better, and because we heavily based on OSGI, there are things that in the OSGI can be done better that we could probably focus on. And this is basically what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so let's, let's have a look at a Java developer um, getting used to a new framework. Um, as you can see, that, that not always work from the very beginning. They sometimes need a little bit of an assistance. You know, someone needs to show them actually how to use the new framework. But then they practice, they get better and better at, at that framework, and they start to fall in love with that. And with time, they become more and more and more productive. Uh, with that framework comparing to people who don't use that framework. Um, so that's an interesting, um, an interesting thing that probably makes you uh, do the same mistake that I did a couple of years ago, which is why not show them OSGI? <laughs> uh, and you know, that's what they should be using, right? It's so cool. It can do so much more with it. It allows you to just do, you know, mind-blowing things, and it's configurable. You can do, you know, you can do things. You can adjust to your field, and oh my God, it's like mind-blowing. And so that's what I tried to do for a while. I tried to talk to people outside and tell them that, well, you should be using OSGI, and uh, pretty much this is the reaction I got. Uh, the data. So, Okay, so what, what then is something that these people actually were interested in? Well, it turns out there are a bunch of technologies out there that are very much appreciated by the Java community. They're nearly not as powerful as OSGI is, but they're easy to use and everyone falls in love with them. So maybe that's the way to go. So there's one question that I ask myself. If OSGI was to solve just one problem that virtually any Java developer can relate to. What would that be? And I thought that I'm going to ask around, and basically the answer that I got from a lot of people that actually are doing OSGI is solving the dependency hell. So, okay, let's see if we can do that. But we do already have a, a, a solution for that. Anyone old enough to remember when we shift software with lips and depths folders? Um, yeah, because I do remember these days, like every time you download something, it's going to have a lip and depth folder and all the dependencies in there. Okay, so at some point in time, we got Maven. And Maven solved that for us by introducing dependency management. Well, the thing is, it was just about making things a little bit easier and a little bit faster, but it didn't fundamentally change the way we manage dependencies. It just changed the way we store them. Uh, we don't you know, ship them with the software. We just put them in a central place, get them from there. But that's barely the only, differ merely the only difference. Oh, we do have some dependencies, but it has a bunch of problems with dependencies. Even though they're transitive, it's still us to resolve the conflicts. If, if, if you get dependencies that are conflicting with each other, it's still you, the developer, that needs to know uh, what goes with what. There is no knowledge in the system about that dependency. 
Another thing is that we do have version ranges. And you, by the way, how many people in the room are familiar with the fact that Maven has version ranges? Okay, half of the room. That's 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 good for the OSGI conference. On a regular Java conference, you barely see like five to ten hands. Like most of the Java developers out there are not even aware of that fact. But still, you know, it, 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 it's up to you to solve like uh, the f most famous example is SLF4J, which pretty much any project out there is using in any version that you can imagine. So it's again, you developer that you need to solve that problem. And then you have scopes, but it, in, it, you, and the most famous scope for me is the, uh, uh, not runtime, but provided, provided scope, because you basically say someone is going to have that thing, but then how do you know that that's someone? Um, it is not you a coincidence. Out of the box. Out of the box. And not a tab. Because the app. By the app. No clue where the actual Tomcat that you will be deploying to wasn't modified by someone. Right? So that, that there is no information uh, that, that you can uh, make use of. And then uh, dependencies in Maven are basically only between artifacts. They can't be expressed as a dependency between anything else, like your operating system or your infrastructure or, or whatever. So it all boils down to the very basic problem, which is the dependency management in Ma that Maven gives you does not tell you anything about why the things depend on the other thing. They basically tell you that thing depends on that other thing. This is, again, you have no information why. And so this is how we look at dependency. We have a box. And that box depends on another box. And that box on another box and so forth. What we are really having to deal with is that something in that box depends on something that's in that other box. And that's your actual dependency, which is well hidden from you when you, when you only deal maven dependency. Okay. And so the next slide is something that's going to be fairly obvious for all of you, I hope, at the OSGI event. But it comes as a shocking news for most of Java developers, which is the fact that you can have something that actually looks inside your box and figures out where that dependency comes from, and then put some metadata in your box to actually describe that, to basically say, I depend on something else because of, right? And you now have a reason. And then, you can actually start talking about contracts. You can start talking about, no, I don't depend on that R box, but I have a contract with virtually any box that has this thing that I need. And so I know this is fairly obvious for, for the people in this room, but for you know, our average Java developer out there, that's like, no way you can do that. So I said, well, maybe we should go uh, one step further. And, and actually prove that this thing um, can work. So here's a little demo that I have. Uh, I think I need to disable, where is my, okay. So I have a, a bunch of projects in here. Um, bear with me, uh, I don't have too much time, so I need to go really quick about that. But essentially there is a, a, a jar file, let's say, a project, which is an API, which only has this interface calculator, which accepts a string and do some calculation. I do have an implementation that's another module, um, which is uh, whatever, it just does some regular expression, doesn't really matter. I have another module, which is called markup, and the markup is pretty dumb. It basically looks for anything that is enclosed with the math stack and uh, calls the calculator to actually calculate what's inside and then prints it out. Uh, and returns it. Well, the tricky part in here is it uses this cool Java 6 feature called service loader. How many of you are familiar with service loader? Okay, uh, now I'm really surprised because uh, it's normal that only two people raise their hands on Java conference. Uh, I thought there's going to be a lot more here, but okay. Anyway, uh, service loader is a fancy new thing, new in, in, in Java 6. I'm not going to have the time to explain to you how it works. All you need to know is it looks on the class path to find out an implementation of an interface. Um, so that's what it does in here. And finally, I have an editor, that's another module, that basically uses the markup. Uh, and uh, what it does is it's, uh, uh, it, it just shows the, the swing window where you can do some calculations. 
So let me build that thing. Uh, I could use package, but never mind. Okay, it, it, those are the models, as you can see. You, you can see the text, right? Um, so th those are like API, simple calculator, markup, and editor, right? And then I can do Java jar. Now, one thing in here is I'm using a Maven Shade plugin to build a single executable, and that turns out to be what most people out there use to build executable jar files. Not going to go into details how that works. Um, so I'm going to just do Java jar editor uh, target editor jar and run that thing. Okay, so this is your calculator. Cannot zoom in too much, but I can probably do this. So here is your expression. You have some math and something in it, and you click on preview and it should calculate it for you. Well, surprise, surprise, this is what happens. Uh, and the reason this happens is the famous service loader. Now, uh, not here, here. Now, let's go and explain that why this happens. Because this is how your dependency graph goes. You have the calc API, the markup depends on calc API, editor depends on markup, and this is what produces your app. And then you have a simple calculator here, which is the implementation, which also depends on the calc API. Well, there's no way for this thing to know that you actually need that simple calculator or whatever calculator to actually work because that's not expressed anywhere, right? So how do you fix that problem? Guess what most Java developers do? They do this. And that solves the problem because indeed markup needs an implementation of the calculator to actually do the job. Then guess what happens? Imagine that's an enterprise project. They invite an external consultant, and this is what happens. They basically tell them, if you only have one implementation of that interface, you don't need that interface, so throw it away and just use the, the implementation. And in this particular case, they kind of have the point. Another way to fix that is to basically say, well, now editor depends on the calculator. Well, OK, that's fine, that's better, but how in the world you'd know? Now, in this particular case, I'm the author of all these things, so I know. But if markup was something that you have downloaded from Maven Central, how would you know that you actually need an implementation and which implementation? This information is nowhere unless you read the documentation and, 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 and do some research about it. Not only that, but what if your editor uses another uh, panel inside that happened to be to depend on another calculator. And then all of a sudden, you have two implementations of the same API in the same jar file, and you can imagine where that goes, right? You end up with like all these jar files uh, that, that you actually need. So how we fix that is by introducing the thing that I'm calling a contract here. And it's very, very simplified version of what you're well aware of, and it's on all in, in OSGI's requirements and capabilities. Um, so basically, we provide some metadata. Uh, we don't speak about OSGI runtime, we don't speak about anything complex, we basically say, well, I'm just going to say in my markup that it requires an implementation of a calculator, and in my calculator I'm just going to say that it, it provides that implementation, and then I'm going to give my editor some options to actually look at and figure out what is it, what it needs. And to make it even easier for developers, you can have, that's an optional thing, you could probably have something locally that's going to suggest to you, like, what exactly do you need to put uh, in, in, in that yellow box so the resolver can actually do the thing. And then when something else comes, well, it, it follows the exact same pattern, but it, the main point is you allow your editor to discover which implement, uh, an implementation of a calculator that you decide to use. To achieve that, there's a proof of concept that I had to write. It's called Eccentric Modularity. It's available on GitHub, and it's essentially a Maven extension. So let me show you how that works. Um, skip that. Need to go here. Close that thing. And, and I'm going to go just right here because I don't have the time to go step by step. Um, 
hopefully this is going to give me some time. Uh, please, where was it? Git. OK. So here is the difference that the changes that you need to make in your code. So the first thing first is you need in your parent, uh, which you don't have to use parents, but in this case, it's just easier. You need to add your exten the extension. So basically telling uh, Maven, well, this is something more that you can do. And this is the three lines of code. Uh, now, this is just a property for the version. Uh, and then you can actually, you, you can add uh, an additional dependency on, that's what, uh, that's only annotations. In that, in that jar file, there is nothing else but annotation and they're compile time only. So that's not a runtime dependency. So that's the first thing to do. And then when you have that in place, all you can do in your uh, modules is actually say in the API, you can just use a, a, a one line like this and say, build me a module. That's all you need to do. You don't need to care really what a module is. It's basically add some metadata into the jar file. And then you can use annotations that you just import to say, well, this thing provides a fantastic calculator, whatever the fantastic calculator thing is. And then on your markup side, you can basically say, well, that thing requires a fantastic calculator, whatever the fantastic calculator thing is, uh, right? And, and then just by doing that, uh, no, not, not just by doing that. You also need to, to change your editor to actually change the way how you build things. So now you tell your editor, well, I'll please resolve all the, uh, you know, what I need. And then you can use this M contractors to provide a list of contractors to inspect to see if they provide the contracts that you're actually interested in. Now, if you don't do that, okay, let me uh, go to here. Hopefully this is gonna work. Uh, editor, 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 palm. This Eclipse sometimes playing jokes on me. So I'm just gonna remove that for a second and try to build it. Um, so if I try to build that thing now, what's gonna happen is it's gonna fail. But it's not going to fail with the ugly requirements and capabilities error message that you get normally when you do stuff like that in OSGI. But instead, it's going to tell you that, well, your fantastic calculator requirement is not fulfilled. And by the way, those two are the things that may help you solve that problem, right? So now you can grab one of those, uh, decide which one, and copy it in your, uh, in your POM file. Uh, and um, actually do that again, and that is going to resolve for you. Okay, so, uh, uh, still here. Need to run that thing again, and if I now do preview, you see it, it now works. Okay, and it, that's not always GI at runtime at all. This is a plain Java app that uses service loader to load services, and it makes use behind the scene, uh, 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 makes use of OSGI technology, but no, the, the people that are using it don't have to be aware of that fact at all. They don't need to know BND, they don't need to know BND run, they don't need to learn anything about OSGI. It's just bringing them a value without having them to uh, learn about all the, 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 the things that, that, are, that are actually happening behind the scenes in a, in a somewhat declarative way. Uh, okay, let's go one step further. Um, where's Git cut? Okay, and uh, I'm just gonna go through here directly. Okay, so now I added two more things, uh, which is I added another implementation called Fancy Calculator. And Fancy Calculator now uses a little bit more things than, than come from the OSGI world, which is a declarative services annotation, uh, which is that component. But it also, it also provides fantastic calculator, but with some options. And for a Java developer, that's, pretty more, that's more than enough information. 
Now, I also created a RESTful service here, um, which is a standard uh, JAXRS service. You can see the standard JAXRS annotations in here. And apart from that, it's a component that uses declarative services, and it uses these two things. It requires JAXRS server and requires power calculator. So basically, you, you just use annotations to say what your thing uh, actually needs. Now, requires power calculator is my own. It requires JAXRS service comes from the M extension. Um, but it's basically, uh, you know, you, you're well aware of how declarative, uh, how uh, requirements and capabilities work. So I'm going to uh, spare the details here. But those are things that, as I said again, regular Java developer doesn't need to know. And then, in, in inside, I use profiles, and I have a standard developer profile where I say build me an executable, and those are the contractors that I want to use. Uh, and also, I can provide here additional contracts that I want to be fulfilled. And in this particular case, because this is my development environment, I want to have a local console, and I want to have a web console for, for that particular application. Now, I need to fix a bug here. Sorry for that. I just realized I released the version 2 with a serious bug in it. But, uh, okay. And when I build this now, did I save it? Uh, uh, no, I need, I need to fix it in here. Pom, pom, please. to make sure it's there. Uh, yeah, uh, I, didn't, I didn't show you the other profile. Okay, so this is my standard profile like for, de for development environment with a bunch of contractors. Um, I also have a library profile, which is doing something different. Instead of, uh, instead of building me a, uh, a standalone executable, it resolves again against an OSGI runtime. It basically says, well, this is where I'm gonna be deploying that thing. So I want you to get all the modules that I need to deploy on that runtime. And, and that's, the, that's the, uh, the main difference. Um, so where is it? Let's build that. That's going to have a few more modules here. It's going to take a while, unfortunately, for the resolver to actually resolve that thing but hopefully it's going to work without issues. So as you can see, we have two more modules. And if I do now Java jar uh, rest target rest jar, this is going to run a, um, uh, a, a single executable. And I already have the, sh the carafe shell in here because that's what I choose to have. I could have chosen Goro. Um, so I can say bundle uh, list, uh, sorry, uh, and see what is inside and do all the, the stuff that I normally do with OSGI. But that's not the point. The point is I can now go to localhost 8080 services slash cog, and I can, you know, I just can access my RESTful service from here uh, and do calculation fancy thing. Um, I can also do something else. I can just add profile life rate to it. And what's going to happen, huh, not to this one, sorry, uh, to this one. And what's going to happen in this case is instead of building a single executable jar file, uh, it's going to basically, as you can see, it says it generates the distro jar from the running environment and now it's going to resolve again that jar file. And now what I can do is I can go to my RESTful service, target, export, and see what, is, what are the bundles that I actually need to run in my runtime. So here's my life rate, deploy, uh, uh, well, the other way around. Okay, I can deploy those. Yeah, they deploy. Let me make sure. Uh, how do I make that bigger? Uh, 
Okay, so you see Jack's RAS connector, RAS, whatever, it's already installed. So now if I go to localhost O services, well, just to show you that that is library running here, or it should be on port 9090. Uh, I should have opened the page earlier. Come on, come on, don't need my time. Okay, so now in, in OSGI we use the slash O prefix to actually, uh, in, uh, in Liferay we use the slash O to refer to OSGI uh, web service, uh, web uh, stuff. So as you can see here, we can do uh, the same thing uh, on, in, in a running OSGI environment, which happens to be Liferay in this case, but could be pretty much, uh, could be pretty much anything. Um, so again, this is a proof of concept. If you want to look at it, it's released on Maven Central, the version 0.2. The reason it's released on Maven Central is I figured no one wants to play with that thing unless it's a, available on Maven Central and they can just add it and, 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 and use it. But if you want to actually see it, uh, the source code, it's on GitHub. I'm totally not proud with the source code. It's a proof of concept. It's been written in my free time and many sleepless nights, so don't make fun of it. It's, it's really terrible in terms of source code. But it works, and it proves the point that you can actually give a Java developer a, a tool to actually make their life easier and to um, actually uh, hide uh, the things that they consider uh, very complex. So the basic idea is this, you have like modules on Maven Central or you have plain jar files on Maven Central and you have this thing called contractor. And contractor is nothing more than a, a, a thing that basically says I provide this and at the same time I require this. It's just, it's just a aggregation of dependencies if you, if you want to think about it that way. And then you can do things like m add contractors and just pass to that a Maven coordinate, a Maven group, it's going to go scan Maven Central and make a local copy of your contractors, of the contractors that it finds. So this is then later on can be used to suggest to you things. So when you actually do build stuff inside your module, you can say, I require something, and uh, you provide a list of contractors or modules, whatever works for you. And if something, if, if it cannot resolve, it's going to actually query the repo and, and, and say, well, by the way, those things may solve your problem, uh, right? The other thing that it does out of the box is if it encounters dependency down the road that is not a module, it's going to automatically convert that jar file into a module. Now, I know now you're going to be throwing things on me because this is not what a proper Java uh, OSGI developer does. And I totally agree with that. But trust me, for those people out there, it doesn't matter as long as it works. And it's a point. I'm not saying this is the best practices. I'm not saying this is what everyone should be doing in their commercial enterprise projects. But it gets them started. It gets them interested. And it also connects to a uh, modular runtime to actually be able to resolve against things that are already running, whether that's your production, your you know, staging, or uh, or whatever that is. And it produces one of the two things. Either it produces a single uh, standalone executable jar file or it produces a, uh, a list of modules that you can later on deploy someplace, um, someplace else. So what else, what, is, what else could do and maybe will do one day if I find the time to do something about it or if someone willing to help? Uh, it's the MVM M run is an, uh, probably the biggest thing that I, I, uh, I get requests for, which is you can like much in the BND run, BND tools, you can keep the, envi the local environment running and developing and then it's going to be automatically replacing stuff because right now you have to run Maven every time. Um, there is some problems with M2 Eclipse right now because M2 Eclipse ignores the Maven extensions, particular parts of the life cycle. Uh, but that, uh, and that's kind of hard to fix, but I'm working with Greg Emerson from Liferate to actually get that resolved. Um, support for remote services, that's big, and I honestly don't have a clear idea about how to do that. Um, but the idea is to mimic the uh, uh, service registry of Spring Boot. Um, more contractors, particular for a famous thing that Java developers how they use. Uh, improve the error uh, messaging, which gives you more hands, better hands, whatever. 
Um, you provide a UI. If, you, if anyone has tried Spring Boot and aware of uh, the spring, uh, start.spring.io, which is a web page where you can just say, this is what I want, and it generates the project for you. Well, that's something that's relatively easy to do and probably, uh, probably should, uh, should be here. Um, support for version ranges, which is not there yet. Um, mm, yeah, and then uh, there is also uh, a need to actually improve a little bit the runtime inspe inspection because right now there is no way to augment the information that you're getting from your runtime. In a sense that if in your, in your runtime you have a bundle that does not provide, that does not declare what it actually provides, there's no way for you to augment your resolver with that information. You can augment it if, if that is a bundle from Maven, but you cannot augment it if that's generated from a runtime. So that's one thing I'm trying to figure out how to do. No, no idea. And probably millions of other things uh, could be improved. As again, again that, consider that a proof of concept to solve a particular problem. And this is where you know more. Like, what in the world you're going to actually waste your time doing things like that? Well, after all, you can do all of this, and even a lot more of this uh, than this, with BND and BND2. The answer to that is it's really hard for a regular Java developer who has never heard of OSGI, not to mention those who have bad experience with OSGI, to appreciate the value of OSGI. Because it's like, I don't, it's, it, they're at a stage where they believe they don't need it. So maybe if we give them something that actually works and that does not impact a lot their learning curve, we're going to bring them to the point where they're going to be making use of that thing without even knowing, make, uh, seeing the benefits, which eventually are going to make them dream about getting even more out of it. Well, I don't know if that's going to work. Don't ask me. But I think it's worth trying. Thank you. Good time. Current. I did in, because, as I said, this is a version two. In a version one, I use the require capability and uh, provide main ability, whatever it's called in BND. Uh, or in OSGI, I keep forgetting which one moved to the spec. The problem with that was that they are not uh, repeatable uh, up until 7, which is supposed to be released sometime in the future. Those are not repeatable. So you cannot have multiple requires uh, on, on a class. Uh, and that it, it, in, in a case when you have a, um, it depends on JAXRS, depends on web server, depends on blah, blah, blah. It's really hard to do that with those types of annotations. Well, with what, how do you declare that your service requires both JAXRS and logging and JPA and something else? So whenever I could, I reuse declarative services annotations. As a matter of fact, all this is like all the service dependencies are done with the standard uh, uh, ser uh, um, declarative services annotations because that's fairly easy to understand. But the requirements and capabilities, uh, first of all, the annotations are way too com the, the existing one were way too complex for a regular Java developer to understand without actually knowing how the things work internally. Uh, and second of all, I could only use one. 
Uh, and, and that was a serious limitation. So I had to go and do. Th there's also another thing is because I wanted to use these annotations to do a little, a little more things. And the way, the only way to do that with the, the normal annotations is to provide a B and D plugin. The problem is that particular part of the, the annotation processing part of the B and D, it's not really pluggable. So it was really hard for me to figure out where in the BND I need to hook myself in order to, to hook it, uh, some logic into annotation processing code. It was much easier to provide my own annotation processing to actually get the job done. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it. I just had to do it somehow. Yeah, yeah, obviously. But again, remember, the first example doesn't use OSGI, so you can't use declarative services in there because there is no OSGI runtime. So, it, yeah, true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. I, it, it's one way to approach it. As I said, treat that as a proof of concept. It, it, it's many ways to improve. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question, which I, I skipped because I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to uh, waste too much time. Um, so, oh uh, shit, I keep doing that again. Uh, how do I get back now? Uh, man. Okay, let's just do it this way. Uh, let me get out of this. Okay, let's just do another one. Uh, where is my code? Ah, here is my code. So if I go to the REST thing and I do MVN uh, dependency <laughs> 3, unfortunately this extension runs all the time. I need to make, it, make sure it doesn't run when it, when it doesn't need to. So this is your, your dependency tree. So on, if you just do, if you just use this on, uh, uh, as a dependency in Maven, those are your dependencies. So you have basically dependencies on some kind of annotations uh, and on uh, annotation processors, which is a compile time only uh, and a free marker. So for, I can probably get rid of those two as well. Uh, and basically the API. But if you look what is actually inside the jar file, uh, which is not generated now, but you can see it in the export, those are, like, so if you do this with Spring Boot, for example, the exact same project, all those would be, uh, and if actually uh, jar from main, would also download, regardless of what is your intent of what, and those will build it for something Right? So if you were to provide the two options, like deploy on Spring, deploy on Caraf, and build a single table or whatever, this list gets mm -hmm. We want to have this as a Maven dependence. Yeah. Okay, so this is not not different than what the BND Maven plugins does. As a matter of fact, with one tiny little where I had to override a Maven, a standard BND Maven plugin, what this thing does is it basically configures BND Maven plugins for you. Uh, it, it, what it does, the extension basically, it da does what you would do if you wanted to do this manually. So you would manually, you would need to add the BND Maven plugin, you would need to add BND Resolve Maven plugin, BND Export Maven plugin, all those things. Basically what this does is does exactly the same thing behind the scenes, on the fly. Okay. 
Well, these annotations are only compile time. The only thing they do is they generate the proper entries in the manifest file. So the, the, those annotations are not, it's much like the BND annotations. They, they don't differ in any way. You don't see them at runtime. They just, they are there for the tooling. So the tooling knows what to generate. There's no, no runtime uh, 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 user annotations. Why, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I'd it's all in the, it's all in the palm. The, the only thing that you have in the code is the exact same thing that you have with OSGI standard annotations for requirements and capabilities. It's no different than that. If, if would normally in OSGI use required capability, provide capability, uh, then it doesn't really matter. You can actually still use the uh, BND annotations in here, and they still will work. Those are annotations, but in the exact instead of generate some metadata in, in, in a manifest file or whatever. Sorry? Uh, okay, uh, so about five minutes. Uh, no, I'm. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.